Okay, so what we have tonight is an appoint, uh, we have an appointment process coming up for the <laughs> first commissioner district in the county of Spokane. And it's, I've invited all the PCOs and I'm glad to see many of them have come. And so that area in yellow represents the first district. Now you'll see there in the August primary and in the primary only the district votes. And so you'll see that uh, this last election where uh, Todd Melke ran, uh, he uh, won by quite a good margin. Then in the general, it goes to the entire countywide, and you can see that uh, lead diminished slightly. So uh, we all know that uh, the third does, uh, or the uh, first district does take in a little bit of the third, and that's probably what uh, diminished it a little. We've got to do something about that. I haven't quite figured out what it is. So the vacancy appointment process is outlined in Article 2, Section 15 of the Washington State Constitution. And uh, there's seats up here, uh, and not there now, but there's three here. And uh, I think there's some in this uh, round uh, table in the corner, Dave, if you'd like to sit there. And so what it reads is, uh, and this is concerning the vacancies, is that, uh, I don't want to read the whole thing, that the person appointed to fill the vacancy must be from the same legislative district, county, or county commissioner or council district of the same political party as the legislator or partisan county elective officer whose office has been vacated and shall be one of three persons who shall be nominated by the county central committee of that party and in case a majority of the members of the county legislative authority do not agree upon the appointment within 60 days after the vacancy, so 60 days after the resignation, uh, after the vacancy occurs, the governor shall, within 30 days thereafter, uh, and from the list of the nominees provided for herein, appoint a person who shall be from the same legislative district, county, or county commissioner, et cetera, et cetera. So the good news about that is that if the commissioners, and in my n recent knowledge, they've all come up with an appointment, but at least Inslee couldn't just pick somebody out of the air and, and appoint them. So, so that's good news. Um, so the Spokane County Republican Central Committee consists of elected or appointed precinct committee officers, elected or appointed officers of the Central Committee and district leaders, because we do have district leaders who are not PCOs, so those people are also eligible to vote. And only PCOs appointed on or before January 7th may vote in this upcoming selection process. And that's because the bylaws of the Spokane County GOP indicate that they need to be uh, hold that position for 30 days before they're eligible to vote. So you've probably all heard this. The official call hasn't gone out quite yet, but you're going to be meeting on uh, Saturday, February 6th at the New Life Church. So that's just down the street uh, east of here. And uh, I know the hours are from 9 to 1, uh, but don't get there at 9 o'clock. Uh, they do what they call credentialing, and that is uh, checking you in, verifying that you are the PCO for that precinct. If your district leader doesn't know you by face, he should identify you through a piece of identification, that kind of thing. So credentialing will open uh, earlier than that, and so do read the letter that you get and be sure to be there in time. So what you're going to be doing is really right now tonight we know of four people that are uh, going to step up to look for that appointment but there may be more uh, we, we don't know at this point so these are some of the commissioner duties and commissioner duties are defined in the RCW so obviously budgeting and appropriation of funds is important uh, you know do they understand that 
uh, building and maintaining county roads. That's important. I think we have 43% of our county roads aren't paved. Uh, making and enforcing civil and criminal resolutions and ordinances that are not in conflict with state laws, including those for land use and building uh, construction. Uh, supporting and implementing state and federal mandates. Uh, they have the executive oversight over all of the appointed county agencies. Uh, construction and maintenance of public buildings. You'll hear a lot about jail, uh, probably. Uh, fixing tax levies for the county and its subordinate uh, jurisdictions. Uh, they authorize the payments owed by the county and auditing of all officers having control of county monies. Uh, they manage county property and county funds. Uh, they prosecute and defend all actions for and against the county. I probably missed some here and you probably all know that the commissioners don't do this all by themselves. Uh, they have a large staff, they have a chief executive officer, they have a chief financial officer, they have a chief operating officer, and then they're the elected uh, people also, so it's, uh, but it's a big coordinated uh, effort that the commissioners uh, do oversee. So who's running? So, so far, uh, what we know of uh, would be Jeff Baxter, Josh Kearns, Nancy McLaughlin, and Dale Strom. And your job as a PCO is to forward to the commissioners the three names that you feel are the best qualified for the vacancy that's being created by Milky's resignation. Each person will have a maximum of five minutes to tell you about themselves, and then there will be time for questions. Now, my last name starts with W, and I get really tired of being the last person or almost the last person called for anything because of the alphabet. And so, because I can, we're going to reverse that order tonight, and we're going to start with Dale Strom first. So, uh, Dale uh, sent me some bullet points on himself, and I'm sure he's going to be telling you more but he's been a longtime resident of Spokane. Uh, he worked for the city of Spokane for 36 years and has degrees in ur urban planning and public administration. So Dale, if you'd come on up here and tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, why you're running, why you feel you're the most qualified, and uh, then when you're through, you don't need to take the full five minutes. <laughs> Please don't know. Uh, then they can ask questions, okay? And if you, yeah. All right. All right, thank you very much. Oh, not there you go. Now I'm on. I guess I'm on. Yeah, let me see. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, green light's on. There we go. We got it? Okay, ooh, loud. All right, thank you for having me out here. I know a few of you, not very many of you, unfortunately. I, even though I've been active in many community organizations, I've not really been, and I've been active in certain campaigns, but I've not been active. I haven't been a PCO. I served as a proxy once for Jim Robinson many, many years ago. Um, attended one of the functions, I think at the, now called the Gateway, I believe. Jim, is that where we used to have those? <laughs> Way back. Um, yeah, you saw a, uh, a bit of my background. I kind of wanted to, talk about um, the fact that uh, I don't know you, most of you, so I don't quite know how to approach that other than talking together over things. So I, I sent out an email, I think to most of you, most of the PCOs should have gotten that. I, I looked at, I think about 55% of you have had a chance to open it, so I guess I'm hoping the rest will, because in there I explain a little more. And I also offered to um, sit down with you, um, coffee or over the phone, uh, and kind of get acquainted. There's not a lot of time, so I would like to get to know you. I I'm going to assume that in most regard, we have shared values. We have common values, okay? That doesn't mean we're going to agree on everything. Each and every PCO is not going to agree on everything but we're Republicans, and we're Republicans for some very good reasons, okay? We believe in freedom, we believe in free enterprise, we believe that government 
uh, should do its duty, but basically not do more than its duty, and that small businesses are, are the heart and the soul of this nation. They provide the doorstep for young people and um, poor people to enter our system and make something if they work hard, okay? I think we, we have a common, uh, we all, well, we have multiple religious space, but I think bottom line, we know that we're not everything. There is a creator, he knows us, and we're to live up to a certain standard of life. So I think those are, to me, those are the fundamental things that make us Republicans. And I'm, I'm concerned that we're not proud enough of that fact. And we have to get back to that. We need to be proud to be a Republican, because we deserve to be proud of that. So we have shared values. Looking at myself and what I can offer, I think the primary thing is that I have the ability to get things done. I have the training, the background, the work projects that I have done in the past. I can work with elected officials. As a staff member, I did that. It doesn't show in here, but I, I, took, I, I took a little step into the political arena about 10 years ago. I decided to run for um, city council here in uh, Valley City. I was living up by East Valley High School at that time, so I was in the Valley City. Now I'm unincorporated uh, north of Millwood, but um, that was a very interesting thing, to get out there and doorbell and get the signs created and learn how to do the, the uh, public disclosure commission filings. Um, it's quite a process, so um, I learned something about campaigning. I learned to listen to folks when I was out there doing that. So I feel like if, if you select me and I'm out there running, I have the knowledge of how to do it, even though I'm not an elected official. Nancy, I think, has got a tremendous background. She's, in terms of being an elected official, she's been there, she's done that. I'm a step behind her, I realize that, in that regard. However, I do work hard, I'm organized, and I've got a ton of contacts. I've got contacts in, well, I guess one thing I should mention. I retired three years ago and moved my mom up here from Wenatchee. She's 92. So I've got her in the other half of the duplex. So I was a little bit late getting here tonight because I always cook her dinner and then get her back to her side. And I was kind of hoping to do a little more of the conversation time. But um, yeah, I, I have that responsibility. But I got off a lot of the boards and commissions I used to serve on. I've served on a ton of boards and commissions in Spokane. Um, I met some of you through the Leadership Prayer Breakfast. I was the program uh, chair for Leadership Northwest for about 12 years, um, helped organize that prayer breakfast. I, um, I've, I've, like I said, I've pretty much given up the other obligations that I had in the past, except for one. I've been very active over the years. I kind of helped found a thing called the Spokane Kootenai Real Estate Research Committee because I was the housing planner for the city of Spokane and needed data about what was going on in the economy and the housing market. So I got very active in, uh, in that organization. I served as administrative officer for about 28 years and editor of a report for about that amount of time. I've got a new editor we just trained uh, Olivia Metz was the uh, economist for the Department of Labor, say Idaho Department of Labor. So she's taking over that role. However, what that work has allowed me to do is develop tremendous connections in the business community. So when we get at the end of this process, the person is, that the commissioners select is going to have to get elected and probably against a reasonably formidable uh, Democratic candidate. So you're going to need someone, or let's say three names, because <laughs> you're going to submit three names. You probably want to pick three names that you think have got a chance to hold on to this seat, because we don't want to lose the seat. And I think that's probably the bottom line. 
are we going to do presentations first and then and then do questions? Is that how you want to do it? All right. So I think I'll surrender the podium at this time. No, you can oh, do well, questions I, now, right? Okay, sure. I just need to get a mic so okay. I can run around for... Tim has it. Oh, Tim has the mic, and Tim's also trying to tell people where there's seats. Uh, got two seats up here. Mike, if you want to come up here and sit. Uh, Tim, you're going to run the mic for questions. So who has a question for Dale? Wait, yeah, wait for the mic. Hi there, Dale. My name is Karen Rollins, and I represent the 7th District. Um, the question I have is, um, based on everything, your history, and the things that are important to the county currently, at this time, going forward, what are the things that are on your heart that are the most important to you? Well, to me personally, or to me as far as what the, what the position could affect? All right, well, <laughs> I think opportunity. I, I, think, I think small business is the key. We, we have to create a climate where employers can employ people in a, and not go broke doing it. Employment is the key to everything. It's, it's how we get our young people. I, I think I remember speaking one time at um, Valley City meeting about a, a land use issue and you know, I want to point out that it's really important that everybody gets a chance. Okay, that's, that's what we're about. We're about open markets, not closed markets. So we have to create an environment where everyone has an opportunity to succeed, especially our young folks. So I, got, I got five kids. I've only got one grandchild so far, but there's gonna be more grandchildren and I want those uh, young people to get an education, get a job, um, hopefully get a house and maybe their own business so that they can grow a life. To me, that's probably the most important heartfelt issue. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, my name is Brenda, Brenda. Grassel, and I represent uh, PCO in the Ninth. And I was, um, you mentioned earlier about values. So could you share with us your connection with the burlesque show that you were emceeing, I believe it was in 2014. I don't know if it was, if you are a part of the burlesque movement in town or you were just asked to emcee that, but I'd like some clarification on that. Okay, well I was actually one of the primary organizers for it. Um, I dealt with, um, you must remember Mark Richard. I went to Mark early on and I asked if downtown Spokane Partnership would be interested in supporting extension of the arts. And he said, yes, we'd be glad to do it. And if you look at the downtown Spokane Partnership's new report, um, their last annual report, we need, we're competing. We're competing with Seattle and Portland, okay? We need the young people that have the skills, both the technical and the creative skills that create new jobs. And we're losing them. We're losing them in Seattle and Portland. And I'm, I'm just frankly tired of it. I wrote kind of a long article, I think, on LinkedIn about what we need to do. And it's a stretch. If you attended, you would have realized how beautiful it was, but you may not have attended. Um, we need to stretch ourselves because we need to keep young people here. In fact, I think we could actually, if we present ourselves in the right way, we could drain Seattle and Portland of some of their younger folks because they can afford to live here. This is an affordable community. So I, I do believe in the arts pretty heavily. I think it's a, it's a gateway to a better economy. Thank you. Next question. I can hear you though, John. <laughs> okay, better. Uh, can you tell us your uh, 
what your understanding of sustainable growth and smart cities? Well, you know, those terms are loaded. Uh, I think those terms usually are used by people that, that want to control others. Um, I'm, you know, again, I, I was, I'm in, I'm a city planner, been involved in it for a really long time. I saw how jurisdictions uh, manipulate the process, and it bothers me. And um, again, my main interest is providing the freedom for everyone to have a chance to buy a home or to be able to afford an apartment. So when, when growth controls get too strict, all it does is, you know, for, I was fighting for years stuff down at City Hall in Spokane that some people were talking about, like rent control has been talked about, okay? Terrible idea. If you look at what it's done in cities where it's applied, it, it ruins the market, contracts the supply, and drives the prices up. So, so then you get a few people that got rent control apartments, and everybody else is, is uh, living poor because the prices have been forced up. So even though it says city planner up there, I have what I would regard as free market points of view on planning. Thank you. I think we have one in the corner, and then we'll take one up there, and then we'll go on to Nancy. Claudia? Well, that was my question, but um, do you know what the, um, what Ickley is? Do you know what Ickley is? Igley? Ickley. Ickley? International Coalition of Local Environmental Initiatives. I do not. Okay. Thank oh, you. Do you know? Okay. Hi. Hi, my name is Debbie Mohite and I live in Spokane Valley. I have a small in-home daycare. Some of my concerns about Spokane is that I don't see any single family homes being built any longer in this community. I see three-story high-rise apartment buildings. And I think like eminent domain and the right to be a homeowner is a very important part of community. And I'm just wondering what you're doing as a city planner to help people be in the home market and to start purchasing homes and what funding, what, what our community can look forward to to um, the next 10 years in home ownership. Well, that's an excellent question. I'm not in city planning now. I've retired. However, I'm still active in that through the Real Estate Research Committee. We do research, in fact, we've got the Real Estate Market Forum coming up um, February 25th at Convention Center. I'm the primary organizer for that event. We're gonna be talking about uh, transportation and lot inventory. So we're gonna have um, Keaton Methcalf from DOT talking about plans for the I-90, or the, excuse me, the North-South Corridor. <clears throat> and we'll have a speaker talk about, uh, Dave Black is gonna talk about uh, real estate implications of that and then we're going to tie that in with lot inventory because uh, the ability to put lots on the market and the ability to put all sizes of lots on the market so large lots and small lots because they're all needed there needs to be a mix of that I also when I was for years um, in the past involved in trying to make sure that uh, there was ability to create uh, manufactured housing communities. There was at one point a move in some jurisdictions to uh, not allow any kind of manufactured home, and that's an affordable house housing forum, and so there, there needs to be options for that. Okay, great. If we have time at the end, we'll come say, back thank you. for questions, and uh, thank, thank you. you. Okay, next will come Nancy McLaughlin. I think probably you all know Nancy. Uh, she is an active lifelong Republican, and as you know, she served eight years on the Spokane City Council. And she and her husband are co-owners of DMAT Construction. So Nancy, come on up and reacquaint yourself. A lot of people here uh, weren't in the third and not in the city, so they don't know you. Yeah. Thank you, Cecily and John, for having me tonight. And uh, 
for those of you who may wondering, is she going to show up? Is she not going to show up? Is she, is she in? Is she out? Let me tell you, when the news came that there was going to be this opening, I had for the first time in five years all my kids and all my grandkids at home. And so I had people calling me, Nancy, you got to do this, you got to do this. And I finally said, okay, I'm going to do it. And then before I had a chance to kind of unwind, I kind of, you know, just kind of thought, oh my gosh, Lord, am I up for this? Have ever you thought that way? It's like, what am I getting myself into again? And for those of you who know, I ran a, a pretty heavy duty Senate race three years ago, raised $140,000 in the third. We still haven't elected a Republican back in the third for 30 years plus, I think now. And so it was a very tough race. Um, but I'm here tonight because I truly believe that, as Dale mentioned, the issue is how are we going to maintain this seat in the hands of the Republicans come November? And I really felt like I had to at least present myself to the PCOs and say, I really think I'm the most qualified, whether at first I was in love with coming back or not, I've, I'm pumped now. I am pumped and I'm asking for your support in that um, process of getting, at least get me on the list. And for those of you who don't know, I'll quickly say that I was raised the majority of my grown up years down in Nampa, Idaho with four brothers. I'm the second oldest. We were like stepping stones. And I tell you, God know what he was doing when he put me with four brothers. He gave me a backbone. And I work with a lot of men. And there's men that really, um, interesting how they want to deal with women. And as good women, we know how to see right through that kind of behavior on certain men, if you know what I'm talking about. But anyway, so I, so, um, I met my wonderful husband. Um, I cut my teeth in business, in my family's business, the largest cabinet company in the Treasure Valley in Napa, Idaho. And so during my high school years, I was cutting payroll, paying bills, making appointments, understanding business from the time I was raised in business. Watch my parents make money and they're not so good and make a little money, not so good. And they risked everything for the lives of the people they worked with. So then we moved to Spokane. I raised, we raised three kids. We've been self-employed from practically day one and I'll tell you right now what's most important to me is that that we know what it means to finance to button to manage our finances at the little end we paid all our bills our home is paid for every vehicle is paid for our business is paid for because we never spent more than we took in and I took those principles with me down to city council, um, stepped up to the plate, even though I have to tell you I'm much more of a, I love the morals issues. I am strongly pro-life. I'm so strong, strong pro-life. Is there any media in the room? Just media. Just media? Okay, okay. So my second run on city council, I had, uh, I had uh, Jonathan Brunt come to me and ask me and say, um, have you ever been arrested? And I'm going, Never tell the media, don't, never give them any more information they don't already have. And I'm going like, what do you mean, Jonathan? Have I ever been arrested? I was doing some research on you. Were you involved in pro-life work? And I'm going like, yes, and I was. And I put my money where my mouth is, and I was in front of a couple abortion, maybe more than a couple clinics back during those years. And that was the stance we were making back then. And then when I sat on the city council, my stance was I sat six years on life services, board of directors, which is the maternity, you know, has the maternity home, helping those women in crisis pregnancy. So I kind of evolved. Down on city council, budget and small business, um, keeping small business. I was trying to time myself. Oh man, small businesses were most important to me because we know what it's like to feel a crunch against um, uh, unnecessary taxes and, and that pressure from government. And I just want to say, government, stay out of my life. I'm paying my taxes. Keep away from me, you know? And I worked, I remember with Brenda Crassel when we in the city of Spokane first dealt with the shoreline master plan and how, how the government was encroaching upon our shorelines and private properties. And thank goodness we had a head start and we spent a lot of time, time dealing and I was, I was trying to help the Spokane Valley out and say, don't let them do this to you. Don't do this. But I felt like I was a very, very conservative voice on city council. It was a nonpartisan race, but I am first a Republican. Well, I'm first a Christian, actually. Then I'm a, I'm a Republican, and I'm a conservative Republican about, you know, I'm, as you guys know, I'm pro-life, pro-property rights, pro-limiting our government, pro-constitution. And I really feel like I have much still to offer. I have the relationships built already in place between the city and the council. I know the city and the county. I know all the players. I served 
I served as the pre um, secretary, then vice president, and president of the Association of Washington Cities. And I'm only telling you that not to say, oh, look, she served on a, on a state organization, but we interacted every year more than once with the county organization, which was our counterpart. And we together lobbied on behalf of cities and counties for good legislation for the both of us and against bad legislation. And if somebody will ask me questions during the question time about my work on trying to bring our costs under controls around unions, I'm happy to tell you what we were trying to do and what we what I would continue to try to do. And there's great segue because it's question, question time. time. Okay. Okay. So much more. So uh, questions for Nancy. <laughs> One right beside you there, Tim. Yeah. Hi. Got to speak into it. Um, I'm Randy Long, and I have kind of a general question. And I think it's applicable to really all of the candidates. Um, I've lived here for 24 years. This time, I was stationed at Fairchild, and when I left Fairchild in '74, I moved back to Spokane in '94, and have lived in in Liberty Lake in the county since then. And ever since I've been here for these 20 plus years, we've talked about high paying jobs, not just jobs, call center jobs, but high paying jobs in this area. We have so much to offer in terms of resources and things that would attract business, but yet it never seems to happen. And a lot of it seems to me to be due to the fact that a lot of the things are regressive here instead of progressive. And I don't mean liberal progressive. I'm, you know what I'm talking about economically progressive. Could you comment on why you think and what the commissioners could possibly do to change that situation and, and promote a, a more vigorous economy in this area? Thank you. Well, first of all, I think if we want to have better paying jobs, we need to get government out of our lives because the government causes us to limit the ability of people to take a risk to start a business because we have a higher failure rate of businesses than we've ever had. And it's because it, it freaks p young people out. They're going like, I don't, I don't want to do this. When they can turn around and get maybe a government job, because government's practically the biggest employer these days, and have a government job, get a, get a huge pension, have, have cushy health care that we're paying for as taxpayers while we're trying to figure out how we're going to pay for our own health care, especially if you're, you're um, self-employed like we are. And so I think that's part of it. Part of it is that we need to continue to develop the, um, well, well, push back against some of the environmental aspects, make better deals with certain departments within the state to develop some of the land, especially up around the airport. We've got lands up there. I know Al French wants to do more development up there. I think that's so wise. We need to bring in light manufacturing. We need to bring in those companies that that um, there's companies over, say, on the west side of the state that are struggling getting their product out because what do they have to deal with? A lot of people and a lot of traffic. But if we can woo them into our area, we've got land by the airport and by the railroad, then that's good for us. And we need to continue to have a strong um, tech schools who are, who are community colleges. And so I think always just um, encouraging that and not being afraid to be bold in those moves of seeking and, and partnering with the economic development people in Spokane and the whole region to bring in those companies and provide them with a better opportunity. The issue is that many times if you want to bring them in, you have to give them something because guess what? If they're thinking about moving, somebody else wants to give them something too. All these incentives. Well, you have to be willing to say, are we willing to give an incentive? Are we not? Is it going to pan out? That sort of a thing. But I agree with you that we need to um, encourage um, the economic development of our area and um, push back against the regulations and the unnecessary of government who thinks they're sitting around thinking of one more thing to try to keep us from being able to do business. John. Another question here? <laughs> yes. Uh, something that's happened more so in this election cycle than I've ever seen in, since I started in the party as a teenage Republican is distrust of elected officials on both parties. Uh, and it's not just at the federal level, it's all the way up and down. Uh, I think the term crony capitalism or something like that. Uh, people may have started off in a certain direction, but they, they stray from it. 
And I think that's why we're seeing at the national level today uh, anybody that's considered uh, part of the uh, establishment is having a hard time. They're no longer trusted. One of the things I look for is what sort of reading have you done over the years in conservative Republican type thinking, whether it be a columnist or certain books that we'd be readily recognized in this room. Um, and also when you go to run, well, you have to raise money and, and get support. It seems like a lot of people think today that the Republican Party is trying to support businesses that want cheap labor any way they can. What are your rules for uh, getting us to trust you in those areas? Well, I would hope that my eight years on the city council and my voting record, if people have questions, when they question me, they'll say, Nancy, how come you took that vote? And when I give them all the background and say, this was our options, we had this or we had that to do, or, and it depended, it depended upon whether or not at the time I was sitting in the majority or the minority of the city council, and in the minority trying to make bad bills less bad, knowing that you were going to lose on that battle and have good bills on that. So I'm hoping that my tra my own personal transparency of people who know me, who've called me, my husband sometimes would watch channel, you know, channel five on Monday night and come home and say, I don't get that. What were you guys doing? Da, da, da. And I realized, oh my goodness, if that's the, what he would see, then we weren't explaining ourselves even on the more conservative end. Because by most of the years on the council, council, I was the only real conservative on it. Mike Fagan and I make, made two of true conservative, some of them were areas. So I would hope that that eight years of really trying to live and vote my values and the things that I believed in will stand for a lot because I've already been tried. People know my voting record and if they want to understand, you know, an explanation about something about that seemed odd, I've, I'm happy to talk to them. I think I'm open. My reading stuff, okay, when I turn on the news, I always watch Fox News, you know. Um, reading, um, I can't remember last, Sean Hannity's book I have in the house. Um, um, I am very, and it's funny, I want to be part of government again, but I distrust my government. So the idea is that you've got to raise up people who distrust the government and hope that they're going to do things from a conservative, biblical way that allows c true capitalism and the people to lead, not government, to tell you where you're going. And so that's kind of my philosophy. I hope I answered your question. Okay, we'll take one more question. Back there. John oh, is there anybody who hasn't asked a question? My name's Michelle and um, I would like to know what your job responsibilities would be as a county commissioner to the people of Spokane County. Okay. Well, we had a list of them up there, but I'll tell you what my, my priorities, unless somebody can share with me um, a priority that's more Im important. Yeah, sure, we wanna make sure that we can get out of our roads and make sure they're plowed and stuff. But to me, there's a couple really, really critical things. You can't let your county go broke and there are always financial issues. The county only has a couple methods of their uh, property taxes and sales taxes as their two greatest revenues. So they fluctuate with the economy. We have some shared revenue with liquor taxes. The state keeps half and the cities and counties split half. We're hoping, I know that I'm gonna go after, you know, we, I'm not happy with marijuana being legal. It's because I still think it's a gateway drug. But um, since it is, I wanna go after our share of liquor of marijuana taxes because we need those revenues. But financially, finances are are key to me. And then it's it's the environment of being able to maintain and develop and grow our small businesses and track those larger businesses that would keep our young people in and being able to to work within the within this area and not lose our young people. Both my boys are are gone. My daughter's still in town, but I want to keep them in. So, does that answer your question? Is it, um, yeah. <clears throat> the person should know what responsibilities that they're supposed to right. fulfill 
for the citizens of Spokane yeah. County. If you don't know the responsibilities, yeah. I don't know how you can fulfill yeah. the yeah. job. Well, 70% of it has to do with criminal justice of the budget, so the courts are a huge issue. And then there's just the day-to-day the -day stuff for the roads, and then, of course, there's all the other um, um, de departments, your treasurers, and, but, but I mean, we're in charge of the budgets, but they have to do, they're, they're independently elected. So I think I understand, especially since I spent eight years on the city council. But I mean, yeah, their responsibilities are outlined in the RCW, yeah. and that's fully. Well, understood that is true, and I know what those responsibilities have because I've researched it. What I'm trying to ask Nancy, if you're running for a position, then she should know right off the bat when people are asking her questions what her responsibilities are. Well, because that's how you yeah. get elected. You have to that's know right. the position that you're running for and what the people of Spokane County is expecting of you. Right, well there's everything. So it's like a test. Yeah, well there's everything from, from the parks and, and uh, recreation of the county to, which I shouldn't put so minimally, but to the budget and your roads, your criminal justice systems, your alternative programs, mental health issues. Um, I'm just, you know, I did it all in the city, I'm just kind of, the jail's huge, yeah, part of the criminal justice system, but 70% of the budget that we're in charge of has to deal with criminal justice and public safety issues. And so, as a city council person, that's what we were in charge of, the whole budget, and now as a county commissioner, we would be in charge of the budget, and to me, it all has to do, it's more than that, though. It's all your uh, lobbying at the state level, it's, it's pushing back against uh, unfunded mandates, it's trying to develop appropriate incentives to bring new businesses and maintaining business, it's pushing back against the unfunded mandates that are coming at you. So it's really kind of exciting because it's multifaceted as far as that goes, but I think my time's up. But it is. John Christina <laughs> had been sitting okay, there. Okay, John. One, one last question then. Just a quick one. Hi. Um, thank you, Tim. I have a problem with this microphone, but uh, just a quick question. You know, one of the big problems that the uh, commissioners are facing have to do with the jail. Uh, it used to be under the purview of the sheriff, now it's under the commissioners. And um, what we've seen over the last year or so are some significant lawsuits. Have you had a chance to research that issue? And uh, what type of uh, plan would you have to try to resolve some of that and make it work more efficiently? Well, about the jail itself, I mean, that's a, that's a loaded question. <laughs> but um, yes. We have to have people who are trustworthy of running the jail, and then we have to make sure that those um, people are doing their job. But financially, we have to right-size our jail. I, I am a strong supporter of keeping criminals locked up, but I'm not a strong supporter of keeping mentally ill people and misdemeanors and some of the issues that are more based in home environments and then they went out and did something or they're off their meds, spending our money. There's cheaper alternatives and I'd rather not have them sit at 140, 50, 60 dollars a day there when, when we have alternative programs that are continuing to be evaluated. So I think we're gonna have to grow with that and I think it's sad because a lot of it, I think, is based in the lack of home life of kids early on, and then they grow up, and, they, and they're feeling abandoned, and they have emotional issues and all this other stuff. But I'm, in all that, I want to be clearer that I'm about keeping our criminals locked up. I want us to be safe. So to me, it's, it's trying to right-size and continually, uh, I guess is where that continuous improvement would come into, and I would certainly, especially since 70% of our budget goes to public safety and those programs, that that would be something that I would be very interested in making sure we're doing it, um, the best we can. Great. Thank you all so much, and I'm against ICLEI and all that stuff, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, these people will have a chance to address you more than uh, just tonight, but we do need to get on with the program. And since we're going alphabetically here, our next person coming uh, to us via video is Josh Kearns. Uh, Josh is not here. I better click him here, John did for me. As you can see, he's the senior legislative assistant to Jeff Holy and the legislation sis, uh, uh, started yesterday, so he's in Olympia. Uh, he did give us a video to show, and uh, Nicole, his wife, is here to step in for him and answer your questions. So you might as well come up now, Nicole, and uh, we'll watch the video, and then you can answer questions that you can. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Josh Kearns, and I'm seeking the appointment to the Spokane County Commission because the people of Spokane County deserve a commissioner who will protect and grow jobs, will hold the line on taxes, and will be an action-oriented advocate for property rights. I will be that commissioner. My theory on taxes is simple. Taxes should always be the last resort. But unfortunately, we've seen at all levels of government, from federal, state, to local, it is often the first. I believe that it is far better to leave the money with those who earned it than to let it burn a hole in the pocket of government. It is our fundamental duty as public servants to do the people's business while living within the people's means. We are elected to make the tough decisions, and as your county commissioner, I will make those tough decisions. Another issue that is extremely important to me is property rights. Several years ago, I was part of a group of folks who put together a property rights forum here in Spokane that ended up being the genesis for our local caper organization, Citizens Alliance for Property Rights. I know it's cliche, but I still believe in the American dream. I believe that if you own a piece of property, you purchased it, you're paying taxes on it, you should be able to do with that property what you see fit. And you should not be forced to listen to some bureaucrat tell you how you can or can't use that property. It is your property. When it comes to the economy, Washington State is unique in that we have an RCW that allows county commissioners to directly engage in economic development. I am a small business owner with my wife. We own a marketing and graphic design company, and I understand what it takes to run a business in Spokane County. I am committed to creating an environment that allows for businesses to grow and prosper, one that encourages businesses to move here to Spokane County. I don't just want to make Spokane County a preference for businesses to locate. I want to make Spokane County the only county that makes sense for them to move to and operate. I'm not just running to get elected. I'm running to lead. I'm running to get things done. I am running to find solutions and I'm running to get results. I apologize I couldn't be there with you tonight. The legislative session has begun and I am in Olympia working as a legislative assistant beginning my sixth session. I am the legislative assistant to Representative Jeff Holy and I assure you we are working diligently, pushing back against Liberal Governor Jay Inslee's attempts to raise your taxes, to strip you of your private property rights, and to infringe on your Second Amendment right to bear arms. But I will make you this promise, we will win. We will fight tooth and nail to protect your freedoms here in Washington State. And I will take those same skills, that same passion as your county commissioner to make Spokane County not just the best county in Washington State, but in the country, and everyone will know it. We will make Spokane County the best place to run a business, the best place to own property, and we will do it by putting the private sector ahead of government and the taxpayer ahead of everyone, and we will stay in the black. And so please join me. Together, we will get results for Spokane County. Thank you. <laughs> so if you have any questions that you would like to ask Nicole, because we all know that behind every man is a great woman. <laughs> and so uh, I'll any do questions? my best. <laughs> Shoot. Yeah, Who's you're first? getting off early. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit. Um, my husband and I have been married for four years. We've been together almost 15. That's more than half of our lives. Uh, we know each other pretty well. Um, we've been lifelong residents of Spokane. We have a small business that does um, graphic design and strategy and marketing. We've actually, um, Josh is a good team player. We've done work for Nancy McLaughlin and Jeff Baxter <laughs> over the years. But um, he's... He, have them pick those up. Yes, so I left some of these in the back. Um, it just lays out a little bit more about Josh and the endorsements that he's received. Um, pretty much every elected official in Spokane County has endorsed him. I'm very proud of that. Um, but if you guys have any questions for me, I don't know what I'm too close to, but I'm getting feedback. Um, okay, I will do my very best to answer.
when Josh comes home, what does he gripe about most? What does he gripe about the most? Um, well, he's, he hasn't been back home yet this session, but in the past five sessions that he's done, this is his sixth, I would say one of the things that he talks about the most, being the most frustrating, is the lack of cooperation across the aisle. And that doesn't mean that he would compromise his values or his boss would expect to be compromised of his values either. It's just that um, there's not even conversations happening. And I think that with Josh, um, if an idea is good, it doesn't matter where it comes from. It doesn't matter if it comes from a liberal, super liberal person or a super conservative person. If it supports Republican conservative values, who cares if the person is liberal from what it comes from? Let's see, what else does he complain about? The drive, the drive's terrible, especially in the snow. Um, he really um, is more of a, how do I fix this than a complainer? Um, from my experience with him. So I um, can't think of anything else off the top of my head. You guys are tough tonight. I'm not running, just reminding you. It's not me that's running, my husband's running. <laughs> Hi, I want to say um, I enjoyed Josh's comments. It was on target. Thank you. I want to thank, thank him for his service to our community and I enjoyed hearing a representative of our government knowing why he's there and what he's supposed to be doing as a public servant. Thank you. Thanks. Um, his contact information is at the bottom of these flyers. He welcomes your calls and emails. Um, if you call during the day, he probably won't answer um, if he's working or if he has a constituent in the office. Um, that is one of his favorite things is constituent relations. He likes hearing what's going on in your lives and trying to find solutions to make them better. If you have a problem with your business or if you have a problem with a particular um, organization at the state level, since that's where he works right now, he really likes kind of diving in and seeing what can be made better, um, what needs to be fixed or maybe get you to the right person. Maybe that's just the problem, but he would enjoy that as well in, at the county level. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Uh, uh, number one, maybe we could see if we could put some chairs from the other room in the back. Is there any empty chairs beside anyone? Raise your hands. So, because we do have folks here that need to, to sit. So if we can possibly do that, that would be great. Okay, got all my papers here. So next is Jeff Baxter. I think we all know Jeff uh, as the former 4th District uh, State Senator. Uh, he's an Air Force veteran. He's owned his own business for 28 years. He's been married uh, for 26, has two grown married sons, uh, very active Republican. And uh, so I'm going to have Jeff come up. And Jeff, I'm sorry you're at the end here, so if you can make it three minutes, I would appreciate it. <laughs> I'm afraid that's not going to happen, but thank you. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> now I understand I normally talk fast. I'm just that type of a person. Tonight I'm going to talk a little extra fast. Matter of fact, I'm going to set my calendar here. Give me just my, my timer uh, so I can watch myself. And here we go. Uh, first of all, I want to give glory to God. I'm a Christian. I want to give glory to God through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For, him, for He gets all the glory. I'm just a vessel that He's being used by. So I want to make that clear, and there's my foundation. I want to start with my background, because I think it's very important that you know a candidate's background, where he stands on integrity, leadership, character, and uh, honesty, because uh, we need more of that. So I'm going to start back when, in my junior high and high school days very briefly. I was, a, uh, I was big into Boy Scouts. I was in Bo Boy Scouts for over seven years, and I was very active in the Boy Scouts. I love it still today, and I still support it today. And I was actually voted into office as a senior patrol leader back for the last three years. I served as a Boy Scout uh, back then. Also, I was a championship wrestler. I point this out because I served, I, I actually wrestled uh, with, at the state level, won many competitions nationally, or na inter internationally there and uh, wrestled for the Air Force for a time as well. But I point that out is because I'm a competitive person and I, I believe in competition. And I brings, believe it brings out the best in people. And if, if I'm competitive and discipline myself 
and, 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 and do that, I believe I can bring out the best in others. And that's what my goal is to do. Bring out the best in myself, in wrestling, and Boy Scouts going back then, to bring out the best in each, each and every one of you. So I believe in that principle. From there, I joined the Air Force. I was law enforcement in the Air Force. I took the test, went through all the things. They said, Jeff, you can pretty much do whatever you want to do. And I said, I want to be a law enforcement and security specialist. So that's what I was, what I, what I did. And I was stationed over in Germany, England, and then finally in North Dakota. I served well, got a lot of honors, uh, was a specialist in a lot of areas, and uh, got an honorable discharge. You might want to make a note of that, because a lot of people get out of the Air Force without a not, not an honorable discharge. I had an honorable discharge. From there, I got uh, married about a year later to Diane. I want to point out I've been married 30 years, uh, very happily married. I'm in the 1 or 2 percent, whatever it is, that's very happily married. For over 30 years, I have two grown sons that are married, and they're uh, doing fantastic, both locally living in the area here. Uh, We've been moved, we, uh, we moved to Seattle right from uh, Grand Forks, North Dakota, to Seattle, and there within about a year or so, we started, uh, uh, got in the credit card industry, visa, visa processing credit card industry. My company's name is Bank Card Systems. Very simple industry back then, and uh, we got into it uh, over 28 years ago. I've been doing business in Spokane for over 24 years, by the way. And what we do is we've had the opportunity to uh, add two additional businesses to that that are in the financial realm that relates with businesses helping to and assist businesses grow and develop. So I know what it's like to meet payroll for dozens and dozens of people through the years. I've done that. I know what red tape's like. I've been through that and I'm going through that. I know what it's like to meet banking regulations because I get scrutinized every year for that. So I've got a little experience in that. So. Here's the thing. I've had, I've had the opportunity, not only being in business for myself for over 28 years, but being a former senator, but actually to be in over tens of thousands of different businesses. Everything from manufacturing to all retail types of businesses, pretty much anything you can imagine. And so I can tell you this, that the taxes and the red tape that were mentioned before are horrendous on our manufacturing facilities uh, and the taxes, the red tape. It's just eating us to death, and we need to get rid, rid of a lot of that. And as a county commissioner, working with the legislatures who I've been doing and will continue to do, I'm going to work at fighting hand-in-hand uh, -hand with the senators, with re our representatives, to keep our le uh, red tape down, keep our, our uh, taxes down, so we can stay in business. Now, we need to talk about long-term financial stability for Spokane County. First of all, we need to work with existing and new startup businesses to expand. Uh, and that is, we need to make sure that we have relationships with them, that we're encouraging them with them, making sure that we're marketing with them as best as we possible, and then encouraging the new startup businesses, people that want to start up or expand their current businesses in Spokane County. That's a good thing to do for county commissioners to be doing. That's one of their responsibilities, by the way. The other thing is to bring in new businesses new business from out of state. That's very, very important. This is going to be one of my strong suits because if we don't have good manufacturing businesses, high-tech in industry businesses, that type of thing coming into Spokane, we can't create the jobs necessary like Comcast, like Caterpillar that employ thousands of people that are good paying jobs, career type jobs I'm talking about. I'm not talking about hamburger flipper jobs. And I feel like I have the ability to bring in these businesses from out of state because my goodness, folks, we live in Spokane County. What other county is there better than Spokane County? I've traveled throughout the United States a lot. And I can tell you, I live here because I believe in the people here. I believe in the business structures here. And I, I love the environment here. And who wouldn't want to move their company here? That's my perspective. Because we are some great people that live in this land of, of Spokane County. And I'm very proud of all of us. Um, so public safety is part of our responsibility. Because over, over two thirds of the general budget actually go to public safety for Spokane County. Me being former law enforcement security, I would support the sheriff's duties in his capacities, the police departments, and, and the jails. They have different divisions there. And uh, that's very important to keep public safety so you and I are safe, not only in our homes, but in, in civic venues, whatever that might be, whether it be at a movie theater or at a park. Uh, enterprise funds. Last thing is enterprise funds. That's a separate funding group, a separate checking account, if you will, that deals with everything from solid waste, roads, parks, golf courses, and detention services from the jail, for the jail. We need to make sure that they're properly funded without raising taxes, without raising taxes, and making sure that we keep the regulations down to a minimum and the red tape down to a minimum so they can do what they do best, and that's run their own business because the government doesn't know how to run their own business, folks. 
uh, it takes businessmen, businesswomen to run their own business. So I'm pretty, pretty founded on that. We need to make sure with those different funds, whether it be enterprise funds or the public safety funds, general funds, that we don't steal from Peter to pay Paul. We make, need to make sure those monies are not redirected or reallocated elsewhere. So I just want to say thank you, and thank you, John and Cecily, for what you do. Thank you, Northwest Grassroots, for providing for the, this venue for us, and uh, we appreciate all the work you do. Thank you. Okay, thank you and hands up for questions. There's a question. Uh, say, Jeff, uh, I know that uh, part of the uh, tax income that the county receives we can't always get it. <clears throat> uh, part of the tax income that the county receives is utilized for setting a, purchasing and setting aside land for future investment uh, for the county. Now, the county also has at this point a, a, a I, I don't know what their property holdings at this time are, but uh, can you get, do you have any valuation of the property holdings that the county has set aside for, uh, you know, future development and investment? I do not. I, haven't, I have not had a chance to look at those figures yet. I'm drinking out of a fire hose as best as I can, like all of us, I think, are. And uh, that's something that uh, I would certainly be looking into, of course. Well, I'm concerned about it because uh, as they build up a, uh, a, a backlog of property and ownership, they're still looking for an increase in taxes at the same time. And, uh, you know, these things, are, it's, it's, it's not what we want as citizens as a, an area or a, a, a layer of government that keeps on consuming a private property and holding it uh, in the backlog. Well, the government, in my opinion, doesn't need to be owning very much property, except for the maintaining of the roads and that type of thing. And what they've gotten into, and I'm not going to get into it here, they've ended up buying, purchasing things through the years that I think the people have, they've made some absolutely wrong decisions, some black hole decisions that's caused the county to lose millions of dollars. And, uh, and you can count me in as a business person that I would seek advice from other people and make the proper decisions so that our government would not expand, we'd not increase taxes, because I don't want to increase taxes because that's going to kill jobs, that's going to kill people's lifestyle, that's going to kill the people that are on fixed incomes, and I'm against that. Yes? I believe Claudia has the mic. Hi, Jeff. My name is Claudia Johnson. Um, the UN has been insidiously developing or establishing chapters all over the United States. And they, our, our senators, our governors, um, mayors, city council, they've turned us over to the UN. And we have a sanctuary city for heaven's sakes. Can you tell me what you would do if the UN offered you money to do what they wanted you to do? Well, first of all, if you have a set of principles, folks, it's like gravity. Gravity is a law. And I have a set of principles that I go by. Biblical principles, first of all, and the Constitution, the Washington State Constitution. So I cannot be bought off to answer your question first. And I would do everything I can as a commissioner to fight it, not only as a commissioner, but work with the local governments and the state governments very hard to not only inform them and educate them, but push back against any U UN control or ICLEI control. Okay, anyone else? Hi, I don't know if this is on. Um, I heard you mention about the county roads here in Spokane. I've only been here since 2010 when I retired. Beautiful city, beautiful city, Spokane. I've been here since 2010. One thing that I noticed here is the roads are like a third world country. And I don't quite understand, I don't under, quite understand how we can let this happen. I know a lot of the money is probably on the west coast that's given it's portioned out, but my concern is, is that when we have roads fixed here, uh, I've been around construction business, being with the CBs, retired from them, and there's no quality control on your roads of what's done. So I want to know as a commissioner, since I'm paying some hefty tax dollars that's going to education, maybe it ought to be reapportioned to these roads and to some quality control to make sure these things happen. <laughs> well, you're right. A number of years ago, the legislature, and I think Jim Robinson can attest to this, took a lot of the money that was our money in our county and put it on the west side of the state. Some of that money was designed for a road. So we're doing the best we can with the roads. I can tell you this, 
that I want to make sure as a business owner, because uh, I'm good at that and I can tell you what I've done in the Senate, if you want to talk to me afterwards, I'd be glad to, that I would make sure the, bis the, the DOT for, for the county here is run efficiently, efficiently, effectively, and that they're doing the right thing with the right priorities. And I'm going to fight to get a lot of that money back. I know Representative Shea and other people are fighting to get some of that money back to maintain our roads. Spokane County, if you don't know, has the largest road infrastructure per county than any other county in Washington State. So we've got the, the largest roads and the largest cared for roads, but we also have the largest uncared for, for roads, as 43%. you mentioned. 43%. 43 percent of the roads are unpaved right right and we can only do what we can do i'm not going to go into debt to, to take care of the roads i'm not going to raise taxes to raise the roads but i can make it more efficient i can make it more effective and i can make sure our priorities are put in the right perspective using the right materials i read this morning about potholes uh, in the roads how actually two cars got seriously damaged with potholes uh, and i know i would have the, the the power to take care of that and also look I can go on this for, for, for a while here, but I will not. Uh, make sure that we have the proper uh, materials going into the roads, because right now, as I understand it, there's other materials out there that's available that the county is not using at about the same price. We need to be looking at that instead of p fulfilling a pothole, and then one week later having a bigger pothole. I think there's something wrong with the materials being used. That very well could be, and I'd be looking into that. Yeah. I, I had a, um, I don't want to take too much to time. We need to go to the next question. Yeah, let's go to the next question. I'm sorry. Another question? Okay, we'll take one more, and then we need to move on. I have a gentleman that needs to talk to you about something urgent, and we have Tim and other question, uh, things to do, so. Jeff, one of the things that is on my mind about accountability with DOT um, is how can you work to hold um, individual um, ABC agencies such as DOT accountable um, for spending? One of the things that I've seen with not only DOT but many other uh, federal or state agencies is um, wasteful spending. How can you deal with government waste? Well. I sat on Ways and Means, which deals with the entire budget primarily back in the Senate. I spent hundreds and thousands of hours going through the, the budget of Washington State. Now I know this is not Washington State, this is Spokane County. But I was the one that caught some of the, the, the wasteful spending within Washington State, pointed out to the other senators. Some got stopped, others did not. We obviously had a minority there. But as a business person, again, it's, the county is, in my opinion, just a big business that needs to be run properly with leadership, with courage, and a person willing to make the right decisions and, and, and forge ahead and negotiate with the people the right decisions to take care of whatever the issues are. And I've got real life experience. I'm the only candidate, to my opinion here, that has the real life experience with business, with military, and being a former senator. And I have the courage to make the right decisions and to do the right things. And I, I would be seeking the advice of many people, of course, just besides myself, because I'm not an expert on any one thing. And I would be working with the people, with the counselors, and with the other commissioners to make the right decision and the hard choices. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, I've been advised that Craig Keller is here with Respect Washington, and he wants to talk very briefly about a murder trial of an illegal alien. So, Craig, uh, I think you've probably caught on that we're running a little late, So, but I was told it was a short announcement. It will be <laughs> short. And Cecily, thank you. From Seattle, I've enjoyed uh, the videos that John and Cecily have put up online during this entire process. Thank you, that's so important. I'd like to get Jeff back to Seattle too, by the way. We need conservatives over there. Yeah. Anyway, I drove to uh, Spokane yesterday so that I could attend the uh, murder trial. There's multiple murder, uh, murderers, uh, conspirators in this trial uh, that started yesterday at U.S. District Court. Um, I sat in it all day today. Very few people in the public, no media there, surprisingly. Huh? Don't um, know about it. Yeah, no one knows about it. There, the, you know, of course, there was an article about the wonderful um, effort that many of you in this room made. Uh, Fred and his, his uh, long-suffering wife, Helen, and Tim and Shannon, 
you know, to collect signatures and many of you in the room. And I want to also say, so there's kind of two things I want to talk about. Despite all the sort of controversy about disgruntled sponsors and whatever, you will not be denied on this. The city council has done a very illegal thing by ignoring this petition. Uh, we will be pursuing this in court and they will be thoroughly embarrassed. But you know, and that's not right because these liberals are shameless. They're truly shameless Amen. people. And, uh, but you know what? It's the general pop populace that needs to be educated. It's just like Obama, Barack the first has educated many of them, not us, but you know, the people that weren't paying attention over the last eight years. That's what's gonna have to happen in Spokane. And it gives me great uh, uh, hopes. I'm, I'm optimistic about this. You know, a little challenges along the way. Uh, but so I just wanna let you know that. Uh, but keep following that, please. And uh, Mike Fagan, oh man, isn't he terrific? <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I want to, I, this is such a blessing to be here at the time of your meeting. Uh, I want to encourage anybody that has the time from 8.30 a.m., you don't have to stay the whole day, but it runs till 4.30, a one hour uh, uh, lunch break. But this trial will continue all the way through the end of next week. And this is the trial of a person that ran a drug network, including in Spokane Valley. His name's Domingo Junior Valdovinos, and his uncle, the trigger man, uh, it's kind of confusing who the trigger man is, but his uncle is a nine-time deportee. Uh, Valdovinos also is an illegal alien, and you and I are spending millions of dollars to prosecute this case. And uh, the public needs to know about it, especially at the time of this initiative process where we want to reverse the fact that they have made Spokane, in, in legal terms, a sanctuary city. It already was before because, like King County, they practice these things, but they put it into law just to agitate us, and we, we uh, stood up, you guys. Good for you. So anyway, no more to be said, Great. but I'm going to be here through Friday attending this thing. If anyone wants to know, please attend. This, these courts are your courts. Uh, it's an open court system, and uh, we need to let people know about the problems. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. Okay, upcoming events. We're going to go through them very, very quickly. Ponderosa Women uh, on Thursday, Red Lion uh, River Inn, uh, 1130. Uh, you probably know there's a Republican debate on Thursday, 6 o'clock. Uh, we aren't doing any meeting here or anything, so do watch. If you want to gather together, great. If you want to watch at home, great. And our next movie night is February 9th, and it's called Agenda 2, Masters of Deceit. And I was hoping John would have the uh, I have it right here. Uh, very, very short clip out of it to play for you. It's uh, this, uh, I think you've all seen Agenda Grinding America Down. This Why is it's great. hard to get a good candidate anymore for President of the United States. Well, we wonder why it's hard to get a good candidate anymore for President of the United States. Well, let me show you how education affects politics. In 1980, there were approximately 40% of Americans that were conservative, 10% liberal, and 50% undecided. And since even our numbers show that they are capturing 85% of our young people each year through the educational system, this is how it plays out. In 2012, America was divided at 30% conservative and 30% liberal with 40% undecided. By 2028, it will be 20% conservative, 50% liberal, and 30% undecided. And by 2036, only 20 years from now, it will be 10% conservative, 70% liberal, and 20% undecided. This is simply demographics, and there is no quick fix to change this. 2016 is the last election in my lifetime where it will even be possible to get an actual conservative elected. So do mark your calendars. I think that you will find this DVD to be uh, of great value and give you a good understanding of some of the things that are going on. Uh, we have open mic time. If anybody does have something to say, I do. 
Uh, there were two new gun bills that were introduced this session. Uh, 2374 concerns the statewide ammunition, ammunition fee of five cents per round. Uh, and 2372 is about destruction of forfeited firearms if you are on bail for a felony or specific misdemeanors. So you could be out on bail for something, you could have your firearms confiscated, they can be destroyed, you can be found not guilty, and they're going to go, whoops, too bad, your firearms are gone. So those are two bills that you need to really weigh in on. And I know those are long URLs, but if you just search for Washington State uh, 2374 and 2372. You'll find it. There's a comment area. Comment on them. Do write down that 800 number. That's where you can call in and make comments. Call-ins are weighted heavily. They make a difference. I think, uh, Jim, you can attest to telephone calls make a difference. Uh, emails make a difference. Comments make a difference. You guys have got to have your voices heard. We're outnumbered on the east side of the state by the west coast population. It's up to you to move your feet and pick up phones. <laughs> <laughs>